Hey everybody, I'm back. Okay, it's time for chapter 13 presentation on global stratification. So fasten your seatbelts and sharpen your mind. I'm going to start with a quote from Rabelais who said, half the world does not know how the other half lives. Maybe you'll have a better idea after this chapter presentation. Figure 13-1 shows the distribution of global income and wealth. You will see that roughly one-fifth of the world controls almost 67% of all global income. So the top 20% control 67% of global income. Uh, now compare that to US where it was about 50% of global income. And the richest fifth of the population, the top 20% control, are you ready for this? Almost 96% of all global wealth. That is staggering. So in the United States, it's only about 89% globally, the top 20% control, 96% of all global wealth, which means the remaining world's population only has between it. The remaining world population, the other 80% of the world, only has between it 4% of total global wealth. Okay, so you need to know for the exam on page 333, a word about terminology uh, that we don't typically use those terms first, second, and third worlds anymore because they are, an, an, they are anachronistic. Uh, why do we have a new classification? Need to know the four reasons. Number one, the old scheme was a product of Cold War politics where you had the first versus the second worlds with the so-called third world countries off to the side. Uh, by the way, what, that term third world uh, countries was developed in 1952. So anyway, it was a product of the Cold War. Okay, what was the Cold War? Um, the Cold you know, Jay Leno, when he used to have The Tonight Show, he used to go out and interview college students. And actually, he'd interview college grads. He'd interview people on the street, too, but his favorite would be interviewing college grads. And he asked them just basic questions to see what they actually knew. And one of my favorites was one time he asked a college graduate, um, who fought in the Cold War? And she said, hmm, let's see, Cold War, that would be Antarctica and... Yeah, those and those penguins, you know, they were they their uniforms consisted of tuxedos, so they were well dressed when they went to war too. No, 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 that's not quite true. Um, and he said, you know, over the years he would take the people who were the dumbest when he'd ask them these questions, and he'd bring them onto the show, and they'd have uh, so he'd have the four dumbest people he interviewed, and then they'd have a showdown on the show to see, you know who could do the best on these trivia questions, which were also pretty simple questions. And he said he would always be afraid that in the meantime, they'd actually study, but he said, nah, they get on the show and be just as uninformed as they were when he'd ask them questions on the street. So a couple of my favorites were, um, they showed a picture and it was the famous uh, drawing of John Wilkes Booth pulling the trigger uh, uh, behind Lincoln, shooting him in the head in Ford's theater, and the question to the to the uh, contenders was, who shot who shot Abraham Lincoln? Showing the drawing, and the person rings the bell and says he did, pointing to the person in the drawing. Another question that I thought was really good was it was a picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano often wore a sometimes he he would wear a, a monocle and he would smoke cigarette with a cigarette holder. So it has him sitting in the back of a car with a cigarette holder, waving to the crowd, right? And the question was, who is this famous president? And the person rang the bell and said, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, we all remember how Jefferson used to ride around in the back of a car and wave to the people. Yeah. Well, anyway, getting back to first world, second world, See, after World War II was over, and you know, you can get a better pictorial of this if you just go uh, look up Cold War map and Google it, and you'll get an idea how the world looked at that time. So um, 
starting in 1944 with D-Day, the Allies invade France. So this is France, Germany, excuse me, France, England, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, and they're driving west toward Germany. Meanwhile, the Soviets are driving east from the Soviet Union, and the two meet in the middle of Europe. Not only do they meet in the middle of Europe, they meet in the middle of Germany. And so, you know, both countries knew that the next problem was going to be between the two of them. So the Soviet Union wasn't about to budge, <coughs> excuse me, and neither was the, the, the Allies. And so they stopped right there. And for the next, let's see, how long was it? Um, 45 to 60, 90. So it was about for 40 more years, 45 years, Germany was divided into East Germany and West Germany. Even more peculiar, peculiarly is the middle of East Germany is Berlin. And so Berlin is a capital city. And so the Allies weren't about to say, well, because Berlin's in the eastern part of Germany, you get Berlin. No, 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 no. So they further went and divided Berlin in half into East Berlin and West Berlin, all of which was in East Germany. So the Allies actually worked out an arrangement with the Soviets that there would be three uh, plain uh, aircraft um, travel routes that were allowed to go into Berlin to provide supplies, which they did. Uh, and so the Berlin Wall was constructed in Berlin, obviously the Berlin Wall, to keep people from East Berlin trying to get into West Berlin and, and get out of the, uh, the communist state that was East Germany. So the East also included uh, the Soviet bloc, as they called it, BLOC, uh, included Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, all the countries that were east of East Germany uh, between that and the Soviet Union were also part of their puppet regimes. And so they had the uh, illusion of democracy, but they're all run by the Soviet Union, each of those countries. They weren't free at all. Hungary was another one. So anyway, what happens over the years, uh, since 1945 up until 1990, when the Soviet Union crashed and the Berlin Wall came down? Well, what happened in the meantime, we would compete with them. So we are democracy and capitalism. They are totalitarianism and socialism. Remember, socialism an economic system, not a political system. And so they were trying to show the world they were the superior systems. We're trying to show the world, no, we're the superior systems. So they would compete in the Olympics. They would compete over a uh, nuclear arsenal. They would compete over the space race, who gets to the moon first. And if we get to the moon first, see we're the superior system. And who are they competing for? All the countries that weren't already allied with one or the other. And so these were often the poor countries in the world called the third world countries. And so the idea is they're trying to get them to come over to our team. So when uh, Cuba was taken over by Castro uh, and we rejected Cuba, well, who do you think they became a puppet of? The Soviet Union, who later on moved, so, moved nuclear missiles into it, creating the 1961 Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the closest the United States ever came to nuclear war. The closest. It was terrifying at the time. Uh, anyhow. Uh, so if you came over to our side, we give you financial aid, foreign aid. If you came over to the Soviet side, they give you foreign aid. And that's how the game was played. You know, we compete with each other over the world. So once the Berlin Wall came down, once the Soviet Union collapsed, what was the point of this first world, second world, third world thing? It was simply a function of the Cold War, which no longer exists. So get rid of the terms. Two. The third world had over 100 countries lumped together, several of which were far better off than the rest. So the classification made no sense in terms of the actual wealth and income of the countries. Three, one advantage of the new scheme is that it focuses on economic development rather than whether societies are capitalist or socialist. And four, a second advantage of the new scheme is that it better clarifies the relative economic development of the rising nations in the world by not lumping them all together in the third world. So instead of first world, second world, third world, we now have high income, middle income, low income countries is the new classification. 
In 2015, the world's total gross domestic product was about $95 trillion. Uh, total world private wealth is about $170 trillion. Uh, 18 million households control more than $1 million in wealth globally. This represents just 1% of the world's population but they hold 45% of the world's $170 trillion in wealth. They will control more than half the world's wealth by the end of next year. Now, those stats were assuming no pandemic, so we'll see if that projection holds true. Uh, the UN Development Report states that the assets of the 200 richest people in the world exceeds $1 trillion. The assets of the three richest people were greater, just three people in the world, their assets were greater than the combined gross domestic product of the 97 of 97 countries, almost all the low income countries. So put another way, gross domestic product is the total output of the country. So it takes all the goods and services produced by a country and converts it into say dollars for the sake of comparison. And then we can say, what's the output of that country? So the assets of three people were greater than the combined gross domestic product of 97 countries. The richest 20% of the world's population consumes 45% of all meat and fish, 58% of all energy, 84% of all paper, and own 87% of all motor vehicles. Well, check out Global Map 13-1. There are 194 or 195 or 196 countries in the world, depending on uh, whose uh, definitions you use as to what constitutes a country. Anyway, the high income countries, uh, 79 countries are defined as the nations with the highest overall standard of living. Uh, let's see, they include countries like the United States, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Western Europe, Israel, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, Japan, Russia, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand are all high income countries. They cover about 57% of the land area on earth. About 2.1 billion uh, people are in high income countries, about 28% of the world's population. Uh, they're per person, also known as per capita, the per person income ranges between 12,500 to 45,000. Now the US is an outlier on the, uh, at 57,000. Uh, so they're on, the, they're on the far end of even the scale, but typically uh, high income countries, the average annual income is between 12,500 to $45,000. Uh, people in high income countries enjoy 60% of the world's total income. Production in rich nations is capital intensive based on factories, big machinery, and advanced technology. High income countries control the world's financial markets and the global economy. Three quarters of all the people in high income countries live in or near cities. Give you another example of the high income uh, countries influence. US, the United States, Japan, and Germany contain 8% of the world's population, but generate 30% of the world's total income. Middle income countries, nations with a standard of living about average for the world as a whole. So you wanna look at what's the typical world citizen, it's in a middle income country. Uh, there are 67 middle income countries, the per person annual income is between 4,000 to 15,000. Uh, by the way, the world median, the one right in the middle is 10,500. So the world median income uh, is 10,500 for the typical citizen in the world. So the average citizen uh, is in a middle income country earning 10,500 per year. Countries that are middle income include most of Central and South American countries much of Eastern European countries, Central and Southeast Asia, and some countries in Africa, including Algeria, Egypt, and South Africa. 4.2 billion people live in middle-income countries, 
58% of humanity. The land area of middle income countries comprises about 27% of the land area of the planet. About 54% of people in middle income countries live near the cities where industrial jobs are common. Uh, but another 46% live in rural areas, which lack schools, medical care, adequate housing, and even safe drinking water. Low-income countries are mostly agrarian societies. I know you know what that means. Mostly agrarian societies with some industry. Most of the people are very poor. There are approximately 48 low-income countries. The per person annual income is less than $4,000. So that means per person they're living on $4,000 per year. Countries include some in Central and Southeast Asia, North Korea, and most of African countries. Uh, 1 billion people live in low income countries, approximately 14% of humanity, and they cover, these countries cover 16% of the planet's land area. In low-income countries, 36% live in cities. Most live in villages and farms following traditional patterns of life. Most live in severe poverty. Well, as you know, I love making my comments. Uh, and here's one that, boy, did it nail us. Uh, this was a comment made by a student in the People's Republic of China to the author of your text. The student said, in China, we waste nothing but time. In America, you waste everything but time. Well, we'd waste time too, but nobody has any. Just ask them, well, I have no time, I have no time. Or we'd be wasting that too. So boy, did he get us in what a throwaway society or in terms of wasting everything. We're much more of a throwaway society than the, than the uh, uh, Western European countries are. So once again, it's just like the uh, Beatles song in the White Album, pigs. We're just a bunch of little piggies. Okay, global wealth and poverty. You need to know this on page 338. What do you need to know in terms of severity of poverty? How severe poverty is? Poverty in poor societies is much more severe than it is in rich societies such as the United States. This is evidenced by table 13-1 and figure 13-2. Note that in table 13-1, which is wealth and well-being in global perspective, provides further evidence of the gap between high, middle, and low-income countries. For every dollar received by individuals in a low-income country, someone in a high-income country is taking home $15. Okay, relative versus absolute poverty. Uh, once again, relative poverty doesn't mean you have a poor uncle. I'll milk that one more time and that's it. <sighs> what it means is that some people lack resources taken for granted by others in that society. So in other words, it, it, you know, you can go to poor people in America and say, well, you're much better off than the people living in, I don't know, Somalia, but that's little comfort to them because they don't live in Somalia. See, poverty is relative to what other people have. That's why that argument is, well, look, you people own things that people in poor nations don't own and you're poor. You should be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's relative to what other people have in your society, not relative to other societies. Absolute poverty is a lack of resources that is life-threatening, which is the case in the low-income countries. So the estimates vary, but approximately there's 1 billion people living in low-income countries, and approximately, it depends on whose estimates, anyway from 700 to 900 million of them live in severe poverty. In other words, life-threatening poverty, don't have adequate food, don't have adequate clean water. Um, obviously, this affects longevity rates, life expectancy, as we saw how the, the difference between the rich and the poor affects longevity here in the United States. Life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa, see that means sub means below, meaning below the, the Saharan desert. So it's those countries in Central Africa. Um, life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa has risen from about 37 in 1960 to 52 today. 
So you're saying, hey, that's progress. Yeah, but that's still about 36 years behind the United States. That 52 years of life expectancy today is where the United States was in 1900. A second point you need to know for the exam, poverty in poor countries is more extensive than it is in rich societies. So the United States has 12.3%, at least up until the pandemic, that were classified as poor, but their poverty is typically not life-threatening. Uh, perhaps at worst, people tend to be more or less malnourished, although I would say that's not limited to the poor. Most of us have no clue how to eat well, and most of us are undernourished or malnourished or not getting proper nutrition. Many of us, I should say, not just the poor. In the world, 25% are malnourished, uh, and and ten excuse me, and eleven percent suffer from chronic hunger. So yes, eleven percent of the world's population lives in extreme poverty, but that's the lowest ever. Uh, yet fifteen thousand people die every day of hunger. Fifteen thousand every day. And we have enough food to feed everybody one and a half times. Some of the realities of global poverty. Each day the world produces two pounds of grain for every person on the planet. This is enough to provide 3,000 kilocalories a day, well above the average need of 2,300 kilocalories. Nevertheless, one billion, nearly one billion people suffer from chronic hunger. So again, there's enough food to feed everybody. It just doesn't get to everybody. Uh, daily caloric consumption of the richest people versus the world's poorest people. Uh, the richest nations consume 3,400 calories a day uh, and they have little physical labor, which is why we go to gym. See, back in agricultural times, we all worked because it was called farming, you know, or taking care of the household. Uh, now we have to go to gyms to get the same level of exercise. In the poorest nations of the world, they consume 2,800 cal kilocalories a day uh, with much more physical labor, so they actually need more calories than they're, they're actually getting. Daily grams of protein per person. Again, this all comes under the heading of, do we produce enough food? We do to feed everyone. Um, how much protein does the average person need? Now, I know for you nutrition majors, it depends on your weight, it depends on your age, because as you get older, you need more protein, blah, 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 blah. But on average, the average person in America needs about 54 grams of protein a day, 54 grams. Okay, how much do we eat? In rich societies, we eat 97 grams of protein. In poor societies, they eat 54. So they get enough protein in poor societies. As for us, we eat almost double the amount of protein we're supposed to be. Why? Because we're so dependent on eating meat, which is such a highly concentrated form of protein. Think about it. Every meal starts with the meat and everything else is considered a side dish. In poor countries of the world where they can't afford meat, meat's like a condiment. It's just used very sparingly because they can't afford it. A person born in the rich world will consume 30 times as much food as a person born in the poor world. Why? Because we're pigs, little piggies, little piggies. Da, da, da. <laughs> That's right, we're pigs. Think about it. Um, uh, we have eating contests. There's actually a magazine that follows who are the best eaters, you know. And so we have, we have all you can eat, all you care to eat restaurants. We have fast food. And here are people in the rest of the world who have no food, right? Uh, it's just really ironic. One time when I was teaching at Moravian, there was a student there from Nepal, which is one of the impoverished countries we've been discussing. And uh, he's taking classes there. And um, the students, he was in one of my classes, and the students said, uh, hey, you know, we, we'd like to learn more about Nepal. Can we ask them questions? He said, sure, let me talk to him. And I asked him, and he said, yeah, sure. Be happy to answer their questions, you know. Now, he's only there his first semester. He's trying to be extremely diplomatic. He doesn't know the lay of the political land. He doesn't want to offend anybody. And so one of the questions they asked, the students asked him in class, said, hey, what's the most amazing thing you've seen in America yet? You know, thinking, oh, New York City or this or that or whatever. And he said, 
he was, he was trying to be so politically correct and humbly said, well, he said, the most amazing thing I've seen so far is he said, uh, when you go into your cafeteria here at school, you put food on your plate you never even eat and then you just throw it away. He said, and he wasn't being sarcastic or critical. At all. He was just trying to wonder, ask why. He couldn't under he couldn't wrap his head around it. Like, why would you put food on your plate you don't intend to eat? He said, in my country, he said, people are scraping food out of trash cans trying to find enough to eat. And you put it on your plate and go, this sucks, I'm just gonna throw it away. Um, and he's not to his point is well taken because in the United States, we throw, are you ready? We throw away 60. Six zero percent of our food each day. In low-income countries, people eat basic cereals. In middle-income countries, they eat basic packaged foods. In high-income countries, people eat prepared, frozen, and health foods. Um, you know, I've been eating health foods for like, I don't know, 45 years. And of course, I get a lot of crap for it over the years. Like, pff, you eat health foods, like, ugh. And so I said, in response, say, oh, yeah, well, if I'm eating health foods, what are you eating? Huh? Number of people per doctor. Rich nations have one doctor for each 680 of us. In poor nations, there's one doctor for each 3,500 citizens. So you think the waiting room times are long here. Um, of the nearly seven, of the over 7 billion people in the world, more than 1 billion drink contaminated water. And in fact, uh, first among the short-term worries with our growing population is how to provide basic necessities for the additional 2 to 3 billion people expected in the next 50 years. Water use is set to increase by 50% from 2007 to 2025 in developing nations and 18% in uh, developed ones, with much of the increased use in the poorest countries as rising rural populations continue to move to towns and cities. Here's the problem. 97.5% of the water on Earth is salty, and of the 2.5% that's fresh, two-thirds is frozen. Not for long under climate change, that frozen water is coming on stream. Um, so there's not a lot of fresh water to deal with in the world. Nutritious food is in short supply in many parts of the globe. The World Bank says that 90, 925 million people are hungry today, partly because of rising food prices that have occurred since 1995, a succession of economic crises like the Great Recession and now the pandemic and the lack of access to modern farming techniques and products for poor farmers. To def so to feed the 2 billion more mouths predicted by 2050, food production will have to increase by 70%, says the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization. That's staggering. Like, how are we going to do that? Uh, now, here's especially like, how are we going to do that when you see that the climate change is causing more and more of the planet to heat up, which means it's going to be more and more difficult to grow food in certain parts of the world where we have traditionally been able to grow food because they're going to become more arid and more desert-like. Life, life expectancy at birth is a major indicator of quality of life. Okay, what country has the highest life expectancy? I'll let you think about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll hum the theme of Jeopardy. Did you know that that you know why why I went through that little song for you is did you know that it actually has been found to fire synapses in the brain? No, I just made that all up. It's not true at all. Okay, it's Japan. Japan, yes, they have the highest life expectancy with 83 years. I'll give you some selected countries. Canada is 81. Germany and the United Kingdom, 80. Uh, United States, 78. Poland, 76. China, 74. Russia, 65. Excuse me, 68. 
Ethiopia 55, and Angola, life expectancy is only 47 years of age. The UN calculation of seriously underweight children below the age of five for high income countries, the rate is 3%. In other words, only 3% of the, and that's mostly in the inner cities or in, in the, 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 the very poor rural areas of the country. 3% uh, of the kids uh, under five are seriously underweight. A uh, sampling of low-income countries, 48% of all the kids under five are underweight in India, 43% uh, in Niger, and in Afghanistan, 39%. Illiteracy rates are high in poor societies. Uh, as I rattle off this data, uh, listen to the differences between men and women. In Saudi Arabia, 10% of the men and 19% of the women are illiterate. In India, 25% of the men and 49% of the women. In Niger, 57% of the men, 85% of the women. And in Mali, 65% of the men and 82% of the women are illiterate. The burden of poverty falls more heavily on women than on men worldwide because women have to raise children, do housework and work and receive little or no reproductive health care in too many of the low-income countries. Each year, about a half a million women die in childbirth. Of these largely preventable deaths, 99% occur in the low-income countries. Okay, so the question becomes, how the heck do we account for this? How do we account for the fact that there's such staggering poverty in so many countries in the world? Well, you need to know this for the exam, Explanations of Global Poverty, which begins on page 343. There are six key factors that help account for poverty in low-income countries. These factors form the backbone for the two major theoretical explanations for global inequality, which is modernization theory and global dependency theory. So check out the six factors. You will see that technology uh, and uh, population growth and cultural patterns are all related to modernization theory, whereas social stratification, gender inequality, and global power relationships are all factors related to uh, global dependency theory. So we're gonna start with the uh, with the theoretical analysis of global stratification on page 344 with modernization theory. So as I go through these two theories, the critical difference in each of these theoretical approaches is where does the responsibility lie for global inequality? Who is responsible? Who are we to blame for this uh, poverty? Uh, modernization theory is loosely linked to structural functional theory, okay? Once again, is structural functionalism liberal, conservative, or radical? Please, somebody know. It's conservative, and this is important so that you realize when you're getting the structural functional perspective, it's always a conservative slant on things. Not good, but indifferent. It's just a politically conservative approach. By the way, when was the Industrial Revolution? Approximately 1750. When do modern times begin in the world? Also 1750, with the beginning of industrialization. Just checking back to see if you knew that. Lenski, technology. Okay. Okay. Um, Modernization theory, uh, if you take a, an economics course, it's called convergence theory in economics. It's a model of economic and social change that explains global inequality in terms of differing levels of technological development among societies. Lenski. Um, a core assumption in modernization theory is that because the entire world was once poor, and that was the norm through most of human history, then it's affluence, not poverty, that must be explained. Okay, so this is like when we were doing deviance theory. We're trying to look at all these theories. And go, hmm, hmm, hmm. Why do people misbehave? How do we account for deviance? And then you have Hershey's theory, and he says, no, no, no. It's just the opposite. How would he account for anybody wanting to behave when it's so much more tempting and fun to misbehave? This says the same thing. Modernization theory says it's not. It's not poverty we have to account for. 
it's affluence that's the exception. For example, assuming that about one sixth of the people who have ever lived are alive today, and that virtually all the people who lived in human history were poor by contemporary standards, and that at least one third of today's global population is poor, if you add these three factors up, then only five to 6% of humanity has ever known any degree of affluence. How is this affluence to be explained and why has it primarily occurred only in the high income countries? Well, modernization theory argues that technology's development came first and primarily to the high income countries because their cultural environments emphasize the benefits of innovation and greater productivity. Now, going back to the old terminology, first world, second world, third world, why this was called the first world, which was the, uh, uh, the Western European countries and America and Canada and, and um, let's see, Australia, uh, Russia is, not Russia, is because the industrial development came to those countries first, hence they were called the first world. The Soviet Union and its allies were called the Second World because the Industrial Revolution came later on there. And that's really true because when the Cold War was over and, for example, environmentalists went into East Germany and some of the Eastern European countries, they were environmental cesspools and the technology was not as developed as it was in the First World countries. So that's where the First World, Second World thing came and the third world countries had virtually no technology at all. So it didn't mean first world like we're number one, it meant first world because that's where the technology where technology arrived first. Traditionalism in the other countries of the world inhibited the development of technological advances. For example, the cultural value we place on achievement is regarded by some sociologists as the crucial factor in advancing or inhibiting development. Modernization theory does not hold that poor traditional nations will forever stay that way. In fact, as technological advances spread throughout the world, one general global form is evolving, the industrial model. Thus, many countries are in various stages of this inevitable shift toward industrialization and consequent economic development. This process is highlighted by Walter Rostow's stages of modernization. Now, we could have come up with these. First is the traditional stage. In other words, the society is still a traditional society. Two is the takeoff stage. Hmm. Three is the drive to technological maturity. And four is high mass consumption where people come to depend upon and need all the products produced. In other words, our wants become our needs, which is where we're at. Uh, all countries, including the US, proceeded or are proceeding through these stages because all want the increased standard of living that capitalist industrialization brings, says modernization theory. Modernization theory holds that high income countries don't cause the poverty in the least developed countries, which is what global uh, dependency theory argues. Uh, on the contrary, rich societies help to solve global poverty. Well, how? Number one, by assisting in population control, one of the leading causes of poverty and environmental degradation. So as populations expand and people need food, they begin to strip the environment. So there's a connection between poverty population growth and environmental degradation. This process also encourages programs that advance the social standing of women. So you may recall, I'm sure you will, that when the shift came from agrarian to industrial societies, uh, all of a sudden men's strength didn't marry, matter so much in terms of livelihood and, and bringing in income. Uh, and so as a result, women's standing begins to advance. So as countries shift from agricultural to industrial, women's standing advances because women can get more, jobs are more widely available to women so that their income can go up. Two, the rich nations help the poor nations by increasing the latter's food production. Three, the rich nations introduce industrial technology into the poor nations. Uh, and finally, the rich nations institute programs of foreign aid to help out the poor countries. 
So this whole argument by global dependency theory, says modernization theory, that the rich nations cause the poor nations poverty is not accurate. George Gilder said, wealth doesn't create poverty, wealth creates prosperity. Okay, now, as you've noticed, you need to always know the critical evaluations of these paradigms. So as I go through the critical evaluation of modernization theory, notice that when I go over global dependency theory, that they're the flip side of each other. Let me put it another way. The criticism of modernization theory are the strong points of global dependency theory. The critique of global dependency theory is the strong side of modernization theory. They're just the flip side of each other. Number one, modernization theory has fallen short of its own standards of success because so far only limited modernization has occurred in the poor countries of the world. Also, some middle-income countries are modernized without massive assistance from the rich countries. Two, critics claim that modernization theory tends to ignore historical facts that thwart development in the poor countries, such as political and economic barriers that seem entrenched, where the rich countries get even richer while the poor countries get even poorer. Uh, three, by minimizing the connections between rich and poor societies, modernization theory offers little insight into how global development continues to affect rich societies where the rich in the rich societies get richer and the poor get poor within the society. Four, by holding up the industrial world as the desired standard for humanity, modernization theory has an ethnocentric bias. In other words, we're saying, hey, the way we live, our materialistic way of living is the way all humanity should live. Uh, so we're imposing that standard on the rest of the world. Um, why? Well, it's good for business, uh, but I would say the jury's still out on that. And in our final class discussion and in the final essays you read, about consumerism, you're going to have to consider that point. Is this the way human beings should live? And if so, what is it costing? What is the cost to us as human beings in living that way? Five, modernization theory suggests that the causes of poverty lie almost entirely within the poor societies themselves. It's sort of like blaming the victim. Uh, blaming the victim is a famous article written about how we in the United States tend to blame the poor for being poor, which is, again, a ludicrous notion. It, you know, it's sort of like saying, um, let me put it another way. On a list of things people most want in life, poor is right above sick and dead. Who chooses to be poor? You may be resigned to be poor, but who chooses to be poor? It's a day-to-day -day struggle, even in the United States. Like, who would want that, you know, uh, which is just a ludicrous argument. So, and so blaming the poor is the same thing here. So we say, you know what, the poor countries of the world, it's all your damn fault because you want to embrace traditionalism. And so yeah, that's your fault that you're poor, uh, as though they don't have a right to embrace traditionalism. Instead, critics argue that the rich country should focus just as much on their behaviors as that of the poor countries. In other words, how we get chastised around the world because of our racial problems. Dependency theory is loosely based on social conflict theory. Okay, social conflict theory, you'll remember is liberal radical. So now you're getting the liberal radical perspective on global poverty. Um, in economics theory, it's sometimes called polarization theory instead of global dependency theory. So it begins on page 346. It's a model of economic and social development that explains global inequality in terms of the historical exploitation of poor societies by rich societies. Critics of modernization theory, particularly from the former communist nations, uh, argue that it was a defense of capitalism and the guidepost for Western foreign policy uh, for the time up until the, for the entire Cold War period. And actually it's true, it was. Well, dependency theorists argue that most of the people living in what is now called the low income countries were actually better off economically in the past than they are today. Uh, now here's their argument. 
People living in tribal cultures and traditional villages, they had cradle to grave security is the argument. They didn't have much, but everybody took care of each other and they could count on that being there for them until the day they died, uh, which is much sooner than in the industrial countries. Uh, the trade-off for us is, okay, we have this unprecedented prosperity, but only the top 20%, and maybe it's even less than that, have any kind of economic security, physiological security. The rest of us are all freaked out. The rest of us are at varying levels of, of physiological insecurity because we don't have enough. Most of the people you know, not just the poor, most of the people you know are one or two paychecks away from the dumpster. You know, so the rule of thumb is you should have six months of pay in the bank. Who has that? Half of Americans have no savings whatsoever, right? And so almost everybody in America, you know, is in varying degrees of economic insecurity, uh, let alone what the hell is going to happen when you retire. Okay, um, so the increasing prosperity of the rich countries, argues global dependence theory, has come largely at the expense of the poor countries, especially through exploitation of those countries' material and labor resources. This exploitation, this exploitation of the poor countries began with the European colonial domination of the world and continues with today's neocolonialism. Okay, check out figure 13-4, you can see Africa's colonial history. So not only did the European countries carve up the Western Hemisphere, they carved up uh, Africa, they carved up, if you remember, England was, uh, uh, has, they controlled the Falkland Islands, they controlled India, uh, the French controlled uh, Indochina, now known as Vietnam. So yeah, these European powers just went around the rest of the world and sort of took them over these other territories uh, by force, of course. Uh, so if you look at Africa's colonial history, starting in 1960, every one of these countries eventually became uh, politically free of their European power. Um, but neocolonialism argues that even though these countries are politically free from their former European powers, they're still totally dependent upon and economically connected to these European powers. So clearly it can be seen today that the political liberation from colonialism did not translate into economic autonomy. Uh, this is a quote by the late president Nkrumah of Ghana describing neocolonialism as being a less obvious form of colonialism. He said, the essence of neocolonialism is that the state subject to it is, in theory, independent and has all the trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its internal policy continues to be directed from the outside by the former colonial power. Now, I mentioned England. England, uh, let's look at around 1850, England was the mightiest power on the planet Earth. Um, and the uh, famous saying was, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, yeah, when you have colonies all around the world, that would be true. Uh, anyway, so that all changed. All these countries like India and Indochina and Malaysia and all the countries controlled by the European powers have now become at least politically free. Com commenting on this, the industrialist Ludwell Denny of Great Britain said, we are not without cunning. We shall not make Britain's mistake again. Too wise to govern the world, we shall simply own it. Well, you got to respect that kind of thinking big. Okay, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein's uh, Capitalist world economy, described in this section on global dependency theory, accounts for the dependency of the poor countries and the rich countries as based on three factors. Number one, the poor countries have narrow export-oriented economies. They have to ship their precious raw materials, their natural resources, to multinational corporations that are centered in the rich countries who actually own vast amounts of the poor countries' lands. Okay, so how does this work? 
same way it worked here. Uh, as the colonial powers come to the Western Hemisphere, all the indigenous people uh, in, in the United States initially, they're all driven further and further west, over 500 treaties broken, as every time they have a treaty and say, okay, this is Indian territory and we shall never cross that line. Of course, they eventually cross that, push the Indians further west if they didn't kill them first, and then that would be Indian territory. Then that treaty would be broken and they continue to put, so eventually the Indians on reservations, that was the final treaty. Well, the same thing happens currently, has happened and currently happens in poor countries, for example, in Africa. So rich multinational corporations or just rich people come in and buy land. Well, what land? The land where tribal villages have lived for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Well, how can they get this land? Hey, the same way people here got the land. So people come in and say, uh, you know, William Penn comes in and William Penn was, he at least tried to work with the Native Americans rather than eradicate them all. And so they come, the William Penn said, well, they said, well, what right do you have from this land? Well, the great white father in England gave me this deed. See, I have a deed. And Native Americans go, well, what's a deed? Here's what it is in short. It means we live here, you don't anymore, right? Okay, well, how's it work in Africa? Well, dictators of those countries who appear to be democratically elected, although they aren't, those are engineered elections. Uh, anyway, so they sell the land or give deeds to the land. They sell the land to these multinational corporations of rich individuals, which effectively says to the tribal villages who are on that land, get out, you can't live here anymore. Um, what's in it for the dictators? They get money. Why do they need money? Because among other things, they want to live a lavish lifestyle. And second of all, they got to hire a shit ton of security guards to keep them protected in that lavish lifestyle because 95% of the country that they're ruling over is living in desperate poverty. Okay, so as a result, so then what happens to the villagers who have lived there for thousands of years? Well, they have to go to the cities. There's nowhere else to live. Uh, more on that when we get to overpopulation in the low-income cities of the world. So how does this all work? Africa is a net exporter of barley, beans, peanuts, fresh vegetables, and cattle, including, including luxury exports of coffee and cocoa. Yet it has a higher incidence of severe malnutrition in, among young children than every other continent. In other words, multinational corporations buy this land, then grow these crops, which they send back to their multinational popul excuse me, their rich country populations to consume, while the poor people in Africa where the food is grown are starving to death. New meaning to the word ironic, huh? Also, the poor countries provide cheap labor for multinational corporations. Uh, I mentioned this previously in the previous presentation where I said, why would you pay an American work $18 an hour when you can pay somebody in China to produce the exact same thing for only 25 cents an hour? Now, when I say the same thing, probably not true. It's probably much better made in America uh, as anyone will tell you when you look at uh, appliances, for example, that were produced 50 years ago, they were much better made than the appliances produced today. A second reason how, a second way in which the rich nations have taken advantage of the poor nations is lack of industrial capacity. The poor countries have to sell their raw materials cheap to raise badly needed cash and can afford little of the expensive industrialized countries manufactured goods from these same raw materials. Um, okay, so when you're in a poor nation of the world uh, and you got oil, you can't necessarily wait for the oil price to go up. Nigeria has oil. So Nigeria, they got to sell the oil when it comes out of the ground. They can't afford to hang on to it. You got to sell the diamonds when they come out of the ground in South Africa. So why? You can't wait for prices to come up. You can't afford to because you got to raise the money to feed your starving populations. See, it works differently here. Every market has, every commodity has a market for it. In fact, they're called, cleverly enough, the commodity markets. So there's one for oats, barley, beans, 
oil, gold, silver, everything you can imagine, there's a market where you can trade on it. Now, initially these markets were set up for, let's suppose I'm a farmer and I'm growing corn. Uh, what if the corn crop goes south? What if a uh, terrible weather comes in, drought, whatever, and I can't grow corn? What's gonna protect me? Well, I can on the commodities market, sell corn, which effectively means I buy corn at this price and six months from now when my harvest comes in, if it's a bad harvest, I'll make money because I was betting on the price of corn going down um, or up. And so the, you hedge, it's called hedging your, your crop. And so you hedge, but now it's turned out to anybody, you or I could go buy a contract of barley, beans, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, whatever you want, you can buy it on the commodities market. So if I'm a, a rich farmer here and I grow corn and I don't like the price right now, I can afford to store it in a silo and just sit on it. I got money and wait for a better price to come. Well, in poor countries of the world, they can't wait for the better price to come. They got to immediately sell it at whatever price and everybody knows it. So they get low balled. Uh, because they got to sell their stuff to raise money for their population. A third reason why the poor nations of the world, or excuse me, how the poor nations of the world have taken advantage of, uh, have been taken advantage of by the rich nations is foreign debt is crushing the economies of low income countries. Um, currently, the poor nations owe the rich nations uh, $5.5 trillion. Um, okay, so how did this come to be? Well, right after World War II, again, with the Cold War, uh, the idea was we want to help out the poor countries of the world. Why? So they come over to our team. So anyway, the World Bank was set up. And the World Bank, the rich countries of the world, the Western countries all put money in the bank, the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Germany, or, West Germany, now Germany, all put money in the bank. And that money is used to make loans to the poor countries of the world to help increase their industrialization. So it could be initially to increase infrastructure. Like for example, you can't have industrial capacity at its maximum in a country if you don't have good roads, if you don't have hydroelectric power uh, or any electric power, if you don't have internet. So these are all to increase infrastructure uh, and then eventually to increase industrial capacity. So massive loans, millions and millions and millions of dollars of loans went to these poor countries as well. And what happened to it? Well, sometimes the dictators would just siphon off the money so the poor people never saw it, or it would be used on projects that were ill-conceived and ill-planned. And as a result, the whole project went south. The bottom line is, as a result of this money that never got spent appropriately for one reason or the other, the poor nations of the world owe $5.5 trillion to the rich nations of the world through the World Bank. Okay, so what happens when you can't pay back your debt? Okay, so let's suppose you're maxed out on credit cards and you ain't earning enough each month to pay it back. So what can you do? You go, you know what? I got this really slick photocopier. I'll just start photocopying Ben Franklin's. I'm not going to tell you on what dollar bill, what nom denomination bill Ben Franklin appears on. You figure it out. Um, U.S. grants on a 50, by the way. So anyway, the idea is just start printing money. Okay, and then you can pay it back. Okay, so imagine if everybody in America just starts printing money. Well, all of a sudden you have a massive amount of money that's chasing too few goods. In other words, the number, the amount of goods remains the same, but all of a sudden there's this huge influx of cash. This is called inflation. It's the it's the classic example of what causes inflation: too much cash chasing too few goods. So the amount of goods hasn't gone up, it stayed the same, but the amount of cash is going up. Now we've seen this hyperinflation we've seen before in American history. After World War I, when we imposed such draconian policies on Germany to punish them for World War I, uh, it got to the point where the, mass, the inflation was so massive, people would literally have a wheelbarrow full of money to go down to the store to buy a loaf of bread. Um, what, here's another example, although not yet to that extreme, and we'll see how the chickens come home to roost, 
but with the absolutely necessary stimulus spending of the pandemic, um, the United States government is going deeper and deeper into debt to the tune of trillions of dollars because we're not taking in sufficient tax revenues to pay back that money. Um, so how does the government come up with $2.2 trillion dollars when there's not enough tax revenues? They just literally create the money out of thin air. Uh, they don't literally print it. What they do is they suddenly sell government bonds, you know, uh, but the government bonds don't actually have anything supporting them as such, except the full faith and trust you have in the US government to ev eventually pay you back. So effectively, through these different devices, the US government just continues to print money, print money, print money, print money. Okay, well, this is exactly what the poor nations of the world did. They effectively just printed money out of thin air, couldn't back it up, just printed it to try to pay back the rich nations. Pope, pa Paul, yeah, Pope John Paul II said, through this mechanism of foreign loans, the means intended for the development of peoples has turned instead into a, a break upon development and indeed in some cases has aggravated underdevelopment. So foreign debt has created massive inflation in some countries. Uh, in the 1980s, at one point, Argentina's annual inflation rate, okay, let me give you an example. If our inflation rate hits 10%, which it has, 10, 11%, people are ready to march on Washington. Why is this significant? Well, because if you're living on a fixed income like the elderly, I guarantee you they're not getting a 10% increase in their social security benefits each year. I will also guarantee you that if inflation's at 10%, the American worker each year isn't getting a 10% increase in her or his pay. It doesn't work that way. So when inflation comes, everybody is losing ground. Things cost more and you're not getting more income to make up for it. Okay, so when it hits 10, 11%, Americans are freaking out. Argentina's annual inflation rate in the 1980s at one point hit 80,000%. Not 80%, not 800%, 80, not even 8,000%, 80,000%. It's staggering. Uh, a friend of mine uh, used to work at Cedar Crest. Uh, she was an anthropology professor. Uh, then moved to Brazil, was teaching at a state university there where inflation was also hitting big time. And she got paid once a month and each month her paycheck went up by 300% and she still wasn't keeping pace with inflation. So this is happening in the poor nations of the world. Laos, Nicaragua and Zimbabwe have external debt running close to their annual production. So in other words, their total output gross domestic product is equal to what they just owe the rich nations of the world. Okay, uh, I said we get back to this two sessions ago. Um, why no Marxist revolution? So Marx predicted 170 years ago that eventually the workers would unite, the proletariat would unite and overthrow the capitalist system. So the big question is, okay, it's been 170 or so years, where's the big revolution? Neo-Marxists use dependency, meaning current Marxist theorists, use dependency theory to argue that polarization, the capitalist versus the workers equals revolution has not occurred within industrial societies as much as it has among the world's nations as a whole that it's now the rich countries of the world versus the poor nations of the world, or as uh, Marx referred to it, capitalist imperialism, as capitalism spreads around the world. Um, and if you look, break it down further, the rich nations of the world are primarily in the northern hemisphere and the poor nations of the world are primarily in the southern hemisphere of the globe. Criticisms of global dependency theory. You will notice that the criticisms of global dependent or not, you will notice that the, <laughs> you will notice or not that the criticisms of global dependency theory are the strong points of modernization theory. Again, they're the flip side of each other. Criticisms. Global dependency theory assumes that the wealth of the rich countries is based solely on appropriating resources from the poor nations. However, wealth has grown everywhere in the world during the 20th century, 
largely due to technological advances, which is what modernization theory argues. Also, the U.S., for example, is drawn on its own raw materials developed. So the U.S. has a rich source of raw materials, as does Russia. So we haven't had to rape and pillage the poor countries of the world's raw resources to uh, enrich ourselves. Uh, we have most of those uh, resources here. Not all of them, uh, but a lot of the critical ones. Some things like palladium uh, and some other rare minerals, rare earth minerals, we don't have, or we are dependent on poor nations of the world to get those uh, for our technology, like catalytic converters uh, and other forms of technology where these rare earths, as they're called, are necessary. Two, if it's true that the rich countries create global poverty, then logically, those nations with the closest ties to the rich societies should be among the poorest in the world. However, the poorest countries are in Central Africa, which have relatively little contact with the rich nations. Also, countries in Southeast Asia have dramatically improved their economic, their economies as a result of close ties and trades with the rich nations. To give you an example, Hong Kong, which is the size of Los Angeles, has double the productivity of Egypt and four times that of Bangladesh. So it's just a city and has uh, twice the productivity of entire countries and four times that of one country, in this case, the impoverished country, Bangladesh. Three, dependency theory simplistically assumes that a single factor, evil world capitalism, has produced global inequality. It therefore ignores factors within the country that may contribute to its economic plight, like the money being wasted by dictators. Four, dependency theory tends to overlook the economic dependency that was fostered by the former Soviet Union, a non-capitalist system. Cuba's economy collapsed as soon as Soviet aid was withdrawn. Uh, and ironically, all of the former second world countries that were communist are now looking for economic help from and cooperation with the capitalist rich countries and all have capitalist socialist society er, economies. Five, dependency theory does not lend itself to clear policymaking. Okay, let's assume this is true, what global dependency says, that the rich nations of the world are raping and pillaging the poor nations of the world, taking total advantage of them. Well, what should the poor nations of the world do in response? Should they go to war with what military? Um, well, they don't. And so neo-Marxists argue that they respond with terrorism that that's the, that's the way of trying to overthrow or respond to the capitalist world order is terrorism. So when small countries don't have a necessary military to fight back, they instead use terrorism. Um, or uh, on a lesser note, a uh, lesser level, should the poor countries of the world, despite the rich nations say, that's it, we're not gonna trade with you anymore. Well, then what are the poor countries gonna do? What would happen to their economies and to the necessary uh, of goods and services they need, how would they acquire them if they cut off trade with the rich countries? Well, as always, I tell you to check out these tables. The table on page 350 summarizes modernization theory and global dependency theory. Again, you get an instant snapshot of the differences between the two. Then if there's still something you don't understand, go back and read it again so that you can immediately characterize the differences by just looking at the table. Uh, the last thing you need to know uh, from this chapter for the exam is on page 350. It's the future of global stratification. Uh, key points here are poverty is partly a problem with technology and it's also a political issue of distribution. So in other words, both modernization theory and global dependency theory have something to contribute. Now getting back to something I said in a previous presentation, here's what you need to know. Every theory is right, but no theory is 100% totally correct. So each theory contributes something to the whole truth. So the error for both global dependency theory and modernization theory is that each one thinks it's got the whole thing figured out, when in fact each has a partial truth to contribute to what in fact is the reality of the whole truth, so to speak. For example, regarding the technology argument of modernization theory, 
Many products from rich countries, such as electricity, technology, and communications equipment are getting cheaper, which helps raise living standards in the poor countries. In other words, as they say in economics, the manufactured goods raw products exchange rate has improved over time. Following the global dependency argument of politics and distribution, Costa Rica, which means rich coast, I'm fond of saying, has an average income at one quarter the US level and the same life expectancy as the US because it disbanded its military in 1949 and can thus afford uh, to spend more on health and education. Brazil with different political policies has life expectancy 10 years lower than Costa Rica, uh, with both being in the same general region of the world. Uh, thus, both modernization theory technology and global dependency theory offer some key insights as to the explanation for the future, for, excuse me, for the unequal distribution of the world's wealth and power. Let me go back to something, how Costa Rica could afford to disband its military in 1945. Well, how, like, how can they get by in a dangerous world like this without a military? Could it be because the United States will fight its wars for it? Bingo. Yes, the U.S. will fight for them. Uh, so as a result of treaties and alliances, some countries hardly need a military because they got the 800-pound gorilla known as the U.S. military to protect them for them. As a result, they can spend much more money on other things, whereas we still devote 20 to 25% of our budget, depending on who's in office, on the military. Uh, check out figure 13-5 to help you for the exam. It's the world's increasing economic inequality. Uh, it shows that both the rich and the poor are experiencing an increased standard of living, as modernization theory claims. But the wealth gap is increasing as global dependency theory claims. So if you put these two together, the bottom line is that while approximately one third of the world's countries are living better now, primarily the high income countries and some poor countries in Asia, for most countries, living standards have remained steady or even slipped in recent decades. <coughs> Excuse me. This is exactly what we discussed about the American dream in the United States. For most people, the American dream is becoming increasingly unattainable. The same thing is happening in most countries of the world. The living standards have remained steady or even slipped in recent decades. Well, I want to close with, let's talk about why is there poverty in the United States? Why is there poverty in the world? Again, when I said I am never attacking the rich, I am attacking capitalism as an economic system that distributes far more to a handful of people than it does to the rest of the population as being flawed in its practice, perhaps even in its theory. What was my go around? Employee owned companies that could operate within capitalism. Anyway, here's the bottom line. Why don't we do more for the poor? You know what the bottom line is? We don't care. I know it seems harsh, and I'm not saying any of you individually don't care. I'm sure most of you do. I'm saying we collectively as a society don't care. And therefore, and we don't take the responsibility for it. So the two are intertwined. Because we don't care, we don't take the responsibility. Because we don't take the responsibility, we justify. We don't. Well, how do we justify this? We say, see, the reason why the poor are poor is it's their own fault. Therefore, we don't have to take responsibility, nor do we have to care because, see, the poor around the world and in the United States, they all have the same fair shot we have. So if they're poor, so be it. You know, this is a meritocracy, which you get in life you earn. The only, if we wanted to cure poverty tomorrow, we could do it. Let me give you an example. Uh, during the time in which we were fighting both the Iraq invasion and the Afghanistan war, we were dropping each week on those two wars $2 billion in total per week, per week, okay? Um, let's suppose instead of conducting two wars, we would have said, you know what? We want to put an end to poverty and shoved all that money into poverty programs or just give the poor money. Just give the people money. We could do that. Just give them the money. 
If we did that, it would change everything. We could overcome poverty in one day. Just say, here's the money. Now you're all out of poverty. Okay? Uh, and we'll talk about why we don't do that in the United States in a future chapter uh, when we get to economics. But anyway, here's the bottom line. When we as a human species collectively care, then and only then will we do something about the poor. That's all for now, kids. See you for the next presentation on Chapter 15. Bye.